Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jimmy Modus, and it's my pleasure to be your guide tonight uh, for this evening's ramble. Uh, as, we lock, as we walk along, I will try to point out some of Linwood's interesting graves, most related to banking. So if you will, please follow me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Philip Trammell Schutze. Now, you're going to have to excuse me for my messy appearance because I was just shot in the head by my esteemed co-worker and friend, Mr. J.W. West Murphy. He shot me not just once, but twice. Once on the top of the head and the other time right, ooh, that ooh. hurt. <laughs> now, before I tell you about the, all the gory details, I want you to all understand that I am not the noted architect Philip Trammell Schutze, you have probably heard about him. He designed the Swan House up in Atlanta and many other beautiful buildings here in our great state of Georgia. That, Philip Trammell Schutze, is Junior, my son. And he is also buried here in the plot that you see right over here beside us. Now, my horrific story begins on the morning of January 16, 1900, 123 years ago, down at the Third National Bank that was located at 1148 Broadway. That was a building that sat on the southeast corner of 12th Street and Broad. There's a building there now that you pr probably would recognize as having a big sign across the top of it that says Sonotus. And that was the location. The Third National Bank was started and run by Mr. Gunby Jordan, and Wes Murphy and I both were working for President Jordan back in those years. And uh, um, Wes was serving as the head cashier in there, and I was starting out as the head bookkeeper, but I was promoted to assistant cashier, both very prominent positions within the bank at that time. Now. Wes and I, we worked well together. We got along. We were friends. So I thought. Now it could have been a case of temporary insanity and that's what the coroner's jury said. They came to the conclusion that it was a moment of um, uh, momentary aberration. And, um, but we have to kind of remember that at that time, Wes was not feeling well, and he hadn't been feeling well for a while. He had developed Bright's disease, which is a kidney inflammation, and that also affects some other internal organs. He had become depressed. He had become paranoid. He thought all of his friends were abandoning him. He was given a leave of absence, and he went to several spas around here, and he tried to get better. Uh, that's what we used to do back in the days, because uh, when you went to a resort or a spa, that's, that was better than going to a hospital because a hospital was a last resort and those were not always great places to go to. Well, this didn't seem to be working for Wes. Now, while he was on his leave of absence, somebody had to take his place as a head cashier, so I was assigned at that, as, at that position, and that kind of bothered Wes, and he thought that I was trying to take his job. Well, on this particular morning in January of 1900, Mr. Jordan had a private conference with Wes and talk to him about going on a train to go to Atlanta to check himself into a sanitarium. Now, remember that a sanitarium is a place where you go to convalesce. It's not for mental disorders. Well, Wes seemed to be okay with that. After that meeting, he came up to me and he said, hey, let's go back into the office. We need to pick up on a project that we had been working on. So we went back in there. I should have known something was amiss when he locked the door. <laughs> Normally, when we went into the office, he kept the door open. We always kept the door open. But for him to shut it and then lock it should have been a red flag to me. I had just sat down and he pulled out a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. And before I knew it, he had shot me across the top of the head and then in the temple and there I was dead on the spot. Then poor old Murph turned the gun on himself. The employees outside had heard all of the ruckus and they could not get in through that heavy locked door so they had to telephone Mr. Jordan. And yes, back in 1900 we had telephones. We'd had them since the 1880s. Mr. Jordan's extension was 27 and the bank extension was 179. Mr. Jordan came down with a key, he unlocked the door and that's where they found us and what a mess. 
Well, a coroner's jury was assembled, and then after thoroughly investigating the incident, they came up with the conclusion that Wes Murphy had killed himself and me while not responsible for his actions. Oh well, such ending the life for two men who were trying to make a living and earning, uh, earning a living and then keeping our families here in this great and thriving town of Columbus, Georgia. Wes had come from Harris County. He was born in 1840. He was 22 years older than I was. And he had served as a delegate for the county up at the Georgia Assembly. He was well experienced in politics, finance, banking. Uh, he served as the assistant state treasurer for some years in the late 1870s. He kind of got himself into some murky waters with some um, contracts with uh, some inmates. Uh, Mr. Jordan had uh, taken him on when the bank was opened, uh, third, third National, back in late 1888. Wes was married to Isabella. They had a son, Wes Jr. And uh, after this incident, Wes was taken up to the uh, Atlanta area where he was buried at the Oakland Cemetery. If you all know where Oakland Cemetery is, it's a real pretty little place that lands between, about halfway between downtown and Inman Park. Uh, Isabella stayed here until she passed away in 1911 and she's buried up there also. Now, then there's me. I was born in Greenville, Georgia, a little town north of Warm Springs. And my father, Daniel, was from Bavaria, hence the Schutz, the German name. And he taught music at the Greenville Masonic Women's College there in town. After I grew up in Chambers County, I moved over to West Point, and that's where I married my sweetheart, Sarah. And I worked at the W.C.L. Lanier Bank there in that town before coming down here in 1889 and working at the Third National. Now, Sarah and I, we built an elegant little home uh, on 4th Avenue, is 1136. The location where that is right now, you may recognize it as a big brick building that's owned by Georgia Power. Mm -hmm. There is a historic marker that is out in front, and that is to honor my famous architect son, and that's out there. We had five children, two of them died very young. Besides Philip Jr., there was Tom and Faye, and they moved to Atlanta. Uh, and also, while I was here, I served on the city council. Now, my obituary, the paper wrote this about me. See if I can read it. Get, get it right side up. It said, um, in my obit, a high-toned gentleman. A, my, a man of excellent business qualifications, noble character, and unquestioned integrity. He commanded respect, admiration, and esteem of those with whom he came in contact. A host of friends are deeply lamented by his death and most profoundly sympathize with the bereaved wife, children, and other relatives. Well, it's not a bad little send-off. <laughs> the memorial that you see behind me, go around and take a look at it. It is absolutely gorgeous. It looks like it's Georgia marble from, uh, from Tate. Probably erected by Philip, my son, um, so many years ago, I don't know. All I know is that I didn't have to pay for it. I am in there, my wife, my wife Sarah, my little daughter Hattie, and then uh, Philip Jr. Thank you for coming in. Theme. Uh, as you know, the theme this year is Bankers and Bedlam, or you can can't you can bank on it. There'll be Bankers and Bedlam. So uh, as we go through the tour, you will meet the people that's going to tell you all about that activity. I'm Helen Johnson. I know many of you, but um, I'm here probably because I've had a little experience in biking, and I guess Bedlam too. <laughs> Who knows? But <laughs> we got through it. I know that. Uh, I spent 25 years at CB&T Synovus, and before that I was at the W.C. Bradley Company, of course, who had a lot to do with the early biking. Uh, but before that, I taught history and English and drama. So uh, all of those careers have a lot to do with what you'll see in this tour. You'll see storytelling and dramatic monologues from these residents who will tell you about some of the bedlam that went on in the early bikes. Obviously, 
they triumph over it because they are truly the foundation, those banks that were here in 1800, for the financial institutions that are here today and successful locally, statewide, nationally, some of them, and a few of them internationally. So we're thankful for their hard work and that they got through the bedlam. As we start our ramble, um, you'll see behind me um, at the tall obelisk, it marks the Bradley plot. Uh, here is the grave of W.C. Bradley, one of Columbus's best known entrepreneurs. Bradley co-founded two banks, which merged to eventually become Sonobas. He was also the chairman of the Coca-Cola Company for 20 years. Just behind the Bradley plot is the Turner Mausoleum, the resting place of D. Abbott Turner, Bradley's son-in-law, husband of Elizabeth Hall Turner. D. Abbott served as president and chairman of the boards of the W.C. Bradley Company and the Columbus Bank and Trust. He was the father of Bill Turner, who passed away in 2017 and is buried at Park Hill Cemetery. So now let's move on to our first speaker and follow me, please. We're about to meet Mr. John Gano Winter, one of Columbus's wealthiest citizens. Come good on, evening, man. Mr. Winter. Good evening. How are you? I'm good. I'm dead, but I don't stink. Please come on in. <laughs> come on in. File on in. The newspaper in Columbus said that I was the very life and soul of the manufacturing and commercial enterprises in Columbus. I was also twice elected mayor of Columbus as the eighth mayor in 1845, and then again in an uncontested election in 1846. But let's back up. I was born in 1799 in New York. I was the son of a wealthy and well-to-do attorney there in town, and my first job was as a clerk in a mercantile house in Lower Manhattan. And it was there that I became very familiar with Southern products and, and businesses in the South. And I learned that there was a lot of opportunity to be had in the South. And so in 1817, I decided to strike out on my own and I re relocated to Augusta, Georgia. Although amongst some of my descendants, it's a rumor that I eloped to Georgia because I did bring a young girl with me who I eventually did marry and whose name was Lucinda. And it was there outside of Warrington, Georgia that we began our lives together and, and raised our family. For 20 years, I was engaged in Warrington as a merchant and owned a small general store. And it was there that I became very familiar with economics and with the practices of our economy here in the state of Georgia. And it was around the mid-1830s that I sensed through my knowledge of our economy and how it worked that an economic crisis was pending. And so I decided that in this system that was heavily reliant on credit and that where there was very little actual hard money to, to fill the needs and the demands of the economy, that what I needed to do to prepare for that panic was to sell everything I owned for gold and silver coin and I held all my wealth as coin. And in 1837, the economy crashed, known as the Financial Panic of 1837. It devastated the entire country and was particularly harsh here in Georgia. And at that time when businesses were, were going bankrupt and banks were closing, and I had all this money I'd saved up, I decided I should could buy a controlling interest in something that I could then run into a profit and generate a livelihood for myself and my family when the country recovered from its crisis. The business I chose to buy was called the Bank of St. Mary's, which was a failing bank on the coast of Georgia at the time. I decided that a bit of rebranding was in order to get the bank back on its feet, and I relocated it to Columbus and arrived here in 1842 as, as a banker, made virtually overnight. This was roughly what I looked like at the time when I arrived in Columbus, around the age of 50 uh, in the early 1840s. So the Bank of St. Mary's quickly became profitable. And it was because of my practices, which were focused on a customer service first basis. Unlike any of the other banks in town, I personally guaranteed my wealth to back the bank and guaranteed that any bank note issued by my bank could be redeemed, if not by the bank's assets, by my own. And no other bank in town made that kind of guarantee. And many of them were not in a position to because they were all run by officers and overseen by board of directors as the sole shareholder of the Bank of St. Mary's, I was in charge, and no one can tell me what to do or how to do it. And that upset a lot of people. Uh, I made a lot of money, became very wealthy operating the bank, but also I was running all the other banks out of town. Many of them closed uh, due to the panic of 37, but and my bank for a while was the only bank in the area 
it was said that I provided banking services for a 600 square mile area and uh, thousands and thousands of people. And all that required me to work 15 hour days. And I often did not take a salary. However, it was the bank, you know, growing in its own assets that I benefited from. And there were those who wished to see the bank close and for the bank to fail. In those days, there wasn't a national paper currency and the U.S. Mint couldn't put out enough coins to meet demand. So the void was filled by local banks and businesses issuing their own paper money, which of course was only backed by the good faith and credit of that bank. And if the bank failed and all your wealth was in that bank's currency, you were broke by the time the bank failed. So my money, and this is what it looked like, issued by the Bank of St. Mary's and endorsed by me as the president, but also a personal guarantee that it would be redeemed by me personally if the bank should fail, was issued at a rate of three to one, which meant that for every dollar in gold that I had stored in the bank, I issued three paper dollars. And that was considered to be a safe bet that if there was a run on the bank, I could meet demand and exchange every bank note for gold. And a couple times in the history of the bank, my competitors here in town wanted to see that happen. And what they did was they hoarded all the money they could find issued by my bank. And on a Saturday morning, they showed up at the bank with heaps of cash and said, we want gold. I met every dollar and <laughs> they redeemed every single one for gold I had on deposit. On Monday morning, the run continued and we were closed on Sunday, which was strategic. But on Monday, everyone arrived again and wanted money for their or gold for their money. And I met every dollar once again without having to dip into my own assets. Finally, on Tuesday, rumors were spreading that I must be dried up. The bank must be ready to fail. You should all you know, run on the bank. And I said, enough is enough. I invited all the leaders in town to the bank. I opened the doors to the <laughs> vault and poured all the gold onto the table and said, the Bank of St. Mary's is open for business. At that point, the run, the run had failed and the bank was successful for a decade to come. And eventually my competitors said, okay, maybe we should leave them alone. And my, I was allowed to turn those 15 hour days into other interests I had in town, including the paper mill, which operated on the Chattahoochee River and turned waste from the cotton mills and the textile mills into paper, which was important here in uh, the frontier of Georgia. And I also had a woodworks and manufactured things out of wood that people needed here in town. I also had a flour mill and we made flour and bread. And it was actually my idea in those days, flour was processed by the mills and, and put in 50 pound kegs to be shipped out. And that wasn't very user friendly for many people. And so it was my idea to bag it in one pound bags at the mill. And people would come to the mill and buy flour directly from me and then walk home with it, which was very customer friendly. Um, another customer service first point that I put into my businesses. However, in the 1850s, a, a, a little cause that became very important to many in the South was secession, and I was outspokenly against it. I was from the North and was reliant on the Southern economy, but I was a unionist and I was outspoken against secession. And that caused many people here to not trust me. And eventually they did organize another run on the bank, which did drain the bank of all of its assets and the bank failed in the 1850s. However, I took to the newspapers and said that I would continue in my pledge to redeem every note out of my personal wealth. And I met every dollar, which resulted in me having a lot of this now worthless paper money in my possession. So take it as a souvenir. <laughs> Eventually, I did have to leave Columbus. I, by my own account, I found it to be too perilous for my own comfort and enjoyment due to my political adversaries. So I retreated back to New York, where I had originally come from. And there they viewed me as a Southern sympathizer. So I wasn't welcomed in New York either. <laughs> so I had to flee to England, where I took up a correspondence with a man called Abraham Lincoln. And then later a man named Andrew Johnson. And I vigorously advocated for my fellow unionists who were here in Columbus, who were not outspoken in their beliefs, but who were loyal to the union. And I pled with the presidents of the United States to protect those men when the Union Army inevitably arrived in Columbus, as they did in April of 1865. That letter is on file at the Smithsonian. And eventually I did die in England and my body, I desired for it to be returned to Columbus to be buried next to my wife, which it was. And we are under that life-size chess looking piece. That's a black square obelisk. That monument accompanied me, my body, on the train ride from New York. And it's one of two stones in the entire state of Georgia made by a particular maker in, in New York. 
and it has his name on it. One of only a few marked stones here in Linwood that has the maker's name on it. And it was upon my body's arrival in Columbus that the newspaper credited me with once being the very life and soul of manufacturing in Columbus. But they also said that of my later years they would not speak because they did not concern the people of Columbus. But I was one of the founders of the enterprises that defined downtown Columbus and that became led to Columbus becoming a textile center for many, many years. And my name was largely forgotten by the men who took over my positions, took over my mills, and whose families and businesses continued into the 21st century. However, it was me first. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lydia Spencer Murdoch. And I want to tell you a story this evening that though it happened more than 180 years ago, seems like yesterday to me. My dear husband, Robert Murdoch, was born in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1815. And after he came to Columbus in 1841, we married in 1842. Now Robert came to Columbus to manage the Western Assurance and Trust Company and he was their bank, their bank manager. He was responsible for collecting all the monies at the end of the day, for making sure all the transactions were done correctly. And the bank was located on Randolph and Oglethorpe Streets, but today that would be 12th Street and First Avenue. They changed all those names right after I passed away. Well, Robert and Alan, Ta Robert and El Alan Bass, who was his teller that evening, we're going into the bank to put all the money into the vault. And Rob, Mr. Bass turned around and said, I forgot to lock the door. So he said, well, take the candle and go and lock the door and come straight back. But as Mr. Bass went toward the door, it burst open and three masked men rushed in, one with a huge bowie knife. He threatened to slit their throats if they uttered a word. And as he held those two men, my husband included, they rushed into the vault filled a satchel with gold, silver, and money, about $60,000. Today, it would be over two million. They pushed Robert and Alan into the vault, locked the door, and told them not to utter a word after they left. So Robert and Mr. Bass sat in the vault for a while, and Robert finally said, you know, they're probably gone. And they started calling out. But because it was evening, no one heard them until the early the next morning. One of the men that lived upstairs, he had an apartment upstairs over the bank, he walked downstairs, he heard them calling out. He rushed into the bank to find it open and opened the vault because they left the key in the vault and got them out. So that whole evening I'm going, Where, where's my husband? Where's Robert? He didn't come home for dinner. Why didn't he come home for dinner? So by the next morning I was just ill with worry and fright. But to my great relief, Robert finally came home and told me all the terrifying things that had happened to them the night before. Um, all of a sudden the police are involved and the whole town of Columbus is very upset. So they put they stationed policemen at each road that was leading in and out of Columbus. Now, don't worry, there weren't that many roads in 1843. <laughs> so they began to look around and someone said, you know, I saw somebody lurking around the bank for several days before this happened. And suspicion soon focused on Mr. Thomas McKean, who was a lawyer in Columbus. Well, they searched his rooms and found $5,000 in a sock buried in a pot of geraniums. <laughs> Don't ask me why he did that. Um, so he was arrested and he was questioned and he wasn't giving answers that they wanted so they told two men to take him out to try to endeavor and get some information from him and they brought him back in and they charged him and on Saturday morning Judge Joseph Sir Sturgis found him guilty chart gave him a thousand six thousand dollars bail and he said well I don't have it so he went to jail but at the same time this is going on suspicion was focused on Colonel John Langdon Lewis now Colonel Lewis was the former mayor of Columbus he was now serving as the prosecuting attorney for the city of Columbus but he was arrested he was brought before Judge Sturgis 
and he was charged with theft of money. And he told him, he said, Judge, listen, Mr. McKean came to me. He said, I stole the money. I need it to be hidden so that I can get out of town. He said, I'm, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. And the judge said, okay, but you're still charged. He fined him a thousand dollars bail, which Colonel Lewis was able to put up. So he was released. Now on Monday, when William N. Jackson was arrested, and he also claimed he was innocent, he was given a thousand dollars bail, which he had, and he was released. But on Thursday, Mr. Jackson was rearrested, and at that time he said, "I'm just going to tell y'all the whole, the whole story." He implicated Colonel Lewis, Mr. McKean, and Alan Bass the man that was locked in the vault with my husband. So they were arrested, they were charged with theft of the money. Well, Colonel Lewis's trial was first, and it turned into quite a political fray because Colonel Lewis was a Georgia Democrat. And they called on Henry Holt, who was a prominent lawyer in Columbus to prosecute the case, and he was a prominent Georgia Whig. So. Both sides decided to call on people, prominent people in Columbus, to help them with this case. And the defense consisted of John Wout Watson, M.J. Welburn, and Seaburn Jones, just to name a few because they had about ten. And the prosecution consisted of Henry Holt, of course, General S.A. Bailey, and they even called in Attorney General Robert Toombs, who later became a senator from Georgia and the Secretary of State for the Confederacy. Well, it took quite a number of tries to find a jury of 12. They interviewed 336 jurors that week before they finally 12, found 12 that would placate both sides, and the trial began. Now, during this week when Colonel Lewis was being tried, there was quite a few things that went around the courthouse. A, Dr. Smith had been arrested for stealing corn. Don't ask me why, the papers never said. And he was awaiting trial after Colonel Lewis. And in the middle of the trial, he drank a bottle of cyanide and committed suicide right in the courtroom. And oh, that caused such a hoopla. And during the time this was going on, a fellow by the name of Simples jumped in the Chattahoochee River and tried to swim across. He drowned because the police were pursuing him because he was selling liquor in Alabama without a license. <laughs> now, the trial lasted over a week, but Colonel Lewis was acquitted. But I'm sad to say that his political career in Columbus was over. He ran for several offices again, but never won another office, and finally he and his wife picked up and moved to Menden, Louisiana, and they are buried there. After the trial, Robert went back to managing the bank, but he decided just banking just wasn't for him. So he became an agent for several prominent insurance companies around the United States and was very successful. He did quite well. Robert and I had six children. Two died before the age of two. But we were very active in Columbus social affairs and we were members of the Trinity Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. I died in 1883 and my Robert lived for 10 more years and he died in 1893. And we are both buried right down the hill <coughs> toward that way. Folks in here from the country, my goodness gracious. <laughs> People will come in from anywhere. Welcome to Linwood Cemetery, I'm Seaburn Jones. I'm buried over here to the left. And this is my son-in-law, Henry Benning. He married my daughter, Mary. We were real proud of him. We used to have a little fort south of here named after him. Don't know what happened when they changed the name there. Can't explain that. Don't know what's going on. So, I'm Colonel Stephen Jones. I was, people I often ask, how was I, how did I end up a colonel? Well, I fought in the War of 1812. I fought in the 1813 First Creek Wars and at Horseshoe Bend. So when I did that, I became very familiar with this area over here. In, when Columbus was founded in 1828, I was living in Milledgeville. At that point, Milledgeville was the capital of the state and there was a governor there, Governor Troop, I was doing a lot of work for. I was his aide de camp. So I got to know him, I was a lawyer, I was into politics, and they opened up this area and they said we could establish a bank in 1829 called the Bank of Columbus. So I took my family, I had a, a daughter Mary and a son Jack, Jack was seven, Mary was 12. I was 40 and I said, we're moving to Columbus, we're going to the wilderness. 
So we moved on down here. We left Milledgeville behind. We started this bank, the first bank of Columbus. It was on the corner of 11th and Broadway, which is where the cast iron bank building is today. Come to find out, we don't get out of this cemetery much except once a, once a year, but I hear they're serving coffee in the bottom of that bank. Never heard such a close thing in my whole life. There was money in bank, and I don't know about coffee, but uh, maybe y'all drink coffee. So anyway, so uh, I owned the bank there for five years. I was the first banker in Columbus, Georgia, and I was the first bank president. So no matter what all these other rascals tell you in here, it was me, Stephen Jones. So remember that when you leave here and you go down there and you get your drink. Pass the information on and nobody heard. So banking was a tricky business back then. Um, you had to have all the money in the vault to hand out paper notes. The nation had no paper notes. This is an example of a paper note that you would have carried around in 1829, and I had my signature on every one of them. And you could bring it back to the bank and I'd have to give you your gold back. Pass that around. So it's tricky business. If everybody came back to the bank and wanted their gold, I could be in big trouble. So banking was tricky. One day, I was building a house over here, which at that point I called it El Dorado. It was way in the country. Y'all might know it as St. Elmo now. Um, big, pretty place. And uh, uh, I built the house and was riding my horse down to the bank. I went in for a big meeting and I always wore this top hat. Welcome to town. Well, there was a murder out front of my bank. And I left the meeting and I ran out to see what was going on. I ended up defending the guy they accused of shooting him, but uh, got him clear. I was a lawyer. I was a good lawyer. I was a good banker. But people started saying I had killed him. I was part of the I was part of the conspiracy. I said nope. Then some people on the street said he couldn't have done it. He didn't have his hat on. They went and found my hat inside of the boardroom. Proof that I hadn't killed the man. <laughs> so as time moved on, my son John got tied up in that little skirmish between the South and the North called the Civil War. I think that's what y'all call it these days. So John went off to war. He, he had had about six children and his brother-in-law, Henry Benning, gave him a leave. So he came home after a couple of years, came to see his wife, Anna. He went back, died at Gettysburg. Poor son died. I never got over it. It was real crippling defeat. He died. Nine months later, Anna was born. There was a baby born. That baby went on to marry John Pease and created Jack Pease. And now in Columbus, Georgia, there are seven living, breathing Jack Pieces. We've been naming people Jack Pease, like George Foreman named his son. <laughs> like the family can't think of anybody else's name. So they just keep on, oh, are there any Seaburns or no Seaburns? I don't know what happened with that. So after, so after about five years, I sold the bank. I said, enough's enough. And a couple of bankers traded banks in the middle of the night. It was very scandalous. But I got my money out, it wasn't a problem. I opened City Mills, it was the first grist mill on the river, and I did. I had a law practice with my son and my brother-in-law, Henry Benning. Um, the Civil War came along, times changed. We had to move in from the house in the country. We just didn't have the help to run the place anymore. And we moved into town. It was a tricky time, but we never recovered from that great war. But we're all here in Linwood Cemetery. Appreciate y'all coming by. It's great to see people. They do let us out once a year. Please come back again. Thank you so very much. For coming. Since our subject tonight is banks, behind me you see the plot we acknowledge, the plot of John Banks. John Banks was a wealthy citizen of Columbus whose home, the Cedars, is on 13th Street. Banks was a successful lawyer and merchant and was involved in banking and manufacturing along with operation of large plantations south of the city. He served as president of the Planters and Mechanics Bank of Columbus, which had been established in 1838. Okay, we're gonna turn the corner here, ladies and gentlemen, and we're gonna head up to meet one of Columbus's most famous bankers, Mr. Gunby Jordan. My goodness, isn't that terrible of an old schutzy? What a shame, I really liked him too. Well, good evening, I'm G. Gunby Jordan, railroad man, industrialist, and of course, banker in this great city. It's so nice of you to come and visit me and my family. Uh, this lot contains my wife, Lizzie, my son, Ralph, uh, his wife, Louise, and many of uh, my wife's uh, uh, Curtis family. Now, I'm not originally from Columbus. I was... <laughs> I was born in Hancock County in 1846, um, and that's where I spent my youth. But I came to Columbus, um, in my late teens to join Nelson's Rangers, an independent cavalry company of the Confederate Army. And uh, it was 
well into the war and I had already lost two older brothers in the conflict. But when the war was over, I decided I wanted to seek my fortune uh, here in Columbus. And so my uh, uncle, Robert Gunby, uh, put me to work in his wholesale grocery business here in 1866. And that same year, I joined the volunteer fire department. Now, while I was there, I helped found the Rescue Hook and Ladder Company uh, in the fire department and they made me secretary and treasurer of that organization. And I discovered I had a head for business and administration, and so did my uncle. And so the next year, uh, he arranged a position for me at the Eagle and Phoenix Manufacturing Company. Now, he was one of the original founders of that mill and was the uh, president of the organization at the end of the war. And uh, they seemed to like me as well, and I actually became secretary and treasurer of that company by 1869. Now, in 1873, we received a charter to operate a bank. And so we set up what was called the uh, savings department of the Eagle and Phoenix Manufacturing uh, Company, and I was made uh, treasurer uh, of the organization. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea, uh, or the, the story about the, uh, the young lady who had sewn her life savings into her skirt and when it got caught in the machinery in the mill and a supervisor had to cut it away to rescue her, uh, her life savings spilled out onto the floor. Well, this is the kind of thing we were trying to avoid. We wanted to secure our employees' funds in our vault and also pay them interest on it. And by the way, this was the beginning of my uh, banking career. Now, uh, while I was at the Eagle and Phoenix, I married uh, the love of my life, Lizzie Curtis, in February of 1881. But my happiness was short-lived. She died in the spring of 1882, uh, shortly after the birth of our son, Ralph. Well, I was uh, devastated by this turn of events. I, I buried her in the wedding gown that uh, she had worn just the year before, and I never remarried. Now, uh, <clears throat> I left the uh, Eagle and Phoenix in 1885 uh, to pursue a construction and uh, railroad interests. I was made president of the uh, Georgia Midland Construction Company that was building or going to build the uh, Midland and Gulf Railroad over the next several years. And uh, in the meantime, I decided to uh, put my banking experience uh, to work, and I founded the uh, Third National Bank in December of 1888, and just a few weeks later, the Columbus Savings Bank. Now, uh, why two banks, you might ask? Well, they, the uh, purposes of the banks were different. One was commercial and one was for savings. And the laws at the time kept those two organizations separate. Uh, however, I was elected president of both banks, and I remained so uh, for over 30 years. Now, in 1889, I was made general manager of the Midland and Gulf Railroad that my construction company had built, and I received a uh, charter for another, the Columbus Southern Railroad. And I stayed involved in both of these uh, until 1894 when they were absorbed into other railroads. But my reputation was such that the governor appointed me to the Georgia Railroad Commission that year. Now, uh, in the meantime, my, uh, the bank, the two banks that I was uh, president of, it's, had gotten all the way through the financial crisis of 1893 with no major incidents. And I was made uh, uh, chairman of a special committee of the Georgia Bankers Association to lobby the governor and legislature on state banking laws. Now that was in, uh, in 1897, and it's the same year that the Eagle and Phoenix went into receivership. And I was uh, appointed one of the receivers. <laughs> and after uh, executing the, the duties of that position to the uh, satisfaction of everyone involved, I was made president of the newly formed Eagle and Phoenix Mills in 1898. And I was uh, soon involved in real estate and educational issues as well. Um, I created the Jordan Company that developed Waverly Terrace in 1905 in Green Island Hills the next year. And I also helped found the uh, industrial high school that later bore my name in 1906. And despite having all of these other responsibilities, uh, I was named president of the Bibb Manufacturing Company, another mill in town, in 1909. Now, it wasn't all uh, work for me. I did have a little bit of fun. As a matter of fact, I appeared in two of the earliest movies filmed here in Columbus. In 1915, in the spirit of Columbus, 
I portrayed John Watkins, a banker, and also the father of the female lead character in the film. And then two years later in the movie The Wrecker, I got top billing as President Jordan of the MNQ Railroad. Uh, there was even a picture of me in one of my scenes in the newspaper. Now, of course, portraying a banker or head of a railroad wasn't much of a stretch for me. I had several years of experience. <clears throat> but I was getting older, and I decided it was time to uh, start giving up some of these responsibilities. I gave up the uh, presidency of the Bibb Manufacturing Company in, in 1913 and the Eagle and Phoenix Mill in 1916. And then as I got to my mid-70s, I realized I, I needed to give up my two banks as well. So I turned over the presidency of the Third National Bank and the Columbus Savings Bank to my very able subordinate, W.C. Bradley, in 1921. And uh, I was able to pass away peacefully in May of 1930, securing the knowledge that I had left Columbus better than I found it so many years before. Now, the banking laws had changed by then, and uh, Mr. Bradley was able to combine those two banks uh, within a, a couple of weeks of my death to become the uh, Columbus Bank and Trust and eventually the Synovus that you know today. Before the sun sets over Linwood Cemetery, I wanted to tell you the story of James Werner, who was born in Ohio around 1830 and enlisted in the U.S. Navy as a young man for some time before switching sides and joining the Confederates. For some reason, at his death, folks began calling him Major James, in spite of the fact that he was actually relatively low ranking. He arrived to Columbus in the Civil War, where he oversaw the shipping yard and the building of the CSS Chattahoochee. His time during the war between the states seems to have been relatively uneventful until Reconstruction several years later. This period was a blow to Southern pride. It was a period of federal occupation and martial law, and save it what you will, it did accomplish its goals for allowing blacks to vote and own property, at least until Union troops were withdrawn in 1871 and the Southern states were readmitted to the Union and a period of disenfranchisement began. Still, the sight of soldiers, including companies of freed slaves and blacks patrolling the streets, was too much for many Southerners. Not all of them, as you heard in the video already, but many many of them. What made it worse was carpetbaggers coming down to buy up land and start businesses that paid pennies on the dollar. And again, a lot of this was actual charitable work, but some people were pretty exploitative. It would be like me moving to Israel right after the war and buying up a bunch of land and building factories and basically paying people a dollar a day to work them. People were very angry at the North, and there was a lot of tension between Southerners and Northerners who were relative newcomers, especially the soldiers, and especially the black soldiers. Major James took a job working for a special treasury agent during this time, recovering Confederate naval property. For the most part, nobody really faulted those Confederate servicemen who decided to collaborate with the Union, so long as they weren't joining the Freedmen's Bureau or mobilizing Republicans. And James was just making ends meet and feeding his four kids and his pregnant wife. On February 12, 1866, a man known only as Lindsay shot a black soldier after a brief scuffle in the streets of Columbus right outside the Naval Yard. The soldier was originally reported dead, but was only injured. As Werner walked past the Naval Yard the following day, he was shot in the leg, seemingly for no reason at all. He hung on to life for a week, his leg amputated, but eventually he died of gangrene. Very little else can be surmised from this story, but newspapers give us a tantalizing hint at a larger regional conflict. James became a martyr, and papers talked of his beautiful children and pregnant sweetheart. They claimed that James, now a major, was one of the most respected men in town, and that he was, quote, not part of the conflict, suggesting some of the black troops were under siege at the time he was killed. Newspapers also mentioned black troops ver verbally assaulting white women, a common rallying cry in the South for a lynching, which would continue for decades after.